chapter three is going to look at chemical bonding. So there are two types of bonding, um, two types of bonding that we're going to look at in this chapter: ionic and covalent. Um, the one thing that these types of bond bonding uh, patterns share is that they're bringing together multiple atoms together in some type of stable way. Now, the way that they come together is different. So in ionic uh, compounds, electrons are going to be transferred. So an element is going to gain electrons or they're going to lose electrons. In covalent compounds, electrons are going to be shared between um, the atoms. Now, we're going to kind of look at these in two different kind of sections. We're going to focus kind of half of this material is going to be focused completely on ionic bonds, and the other half is going to look specifically on the covalent bonds. Um, one thing I want to point out here, if you look at the, this middle point, it says only the noble gases in group 8A don't readily react to form bonds. So those noble gases, the ones in that far right side of the periodic table, the helium, the argon, right, neon, ones like that, those ones are not going to form bonds. They're very stable as they are, so those ones don't um, aren't really involved in bonding. Everything else on the periodic table, though, are able to form bonds, and we'll look at how that happens um, in this chapter. So, two different types. Ionic bonds transfer electrons from one to the other. Covalent bonds result um, from sharing of electrons. And we're going to start off the chapter by looking at ionic bonds. So, ionic bonds form between a metal and a nonmetal. So, again, metals are on the left side of the periodic table. Nonmetals are going to be on the right side of the periodic table to the right of that staircase where the metalloids are. Um, so, for instance, you can have sodium react with chlorine, so sodium being the metal, chlorine being the nonmetal, and then you're going to form sodium chloride, or this NaCl. And one thing you'll notice down here is sodium is written as Na+, and chlorine is actually written down here as a chloride ion, which is Cl-. So both of these are ions, and what we mean by ions is something that is going to be a charged species. Um, and those charged species are formed by either gaining or losing an electron. And that's what we're going to look at now. All right, so ions are going to have an unequal number of protons and electrons, but the, they're formed always by gaining or losing electrons. You do not gain or lose protons. The number of protons stays the same. Remember back in Chapter 2, we talked about this. If you change the number of protons, you change the type of element right that you have. If you add a proton, you move to the next thing on the periodic table. So the number of protons are going to stay the same. The electrons are going to be gained or lost. Then ionic compounds are going to form whenever you have opposite charged ions. So you're going to have a positively charged ion reacting with a negatively charged ion. Those are going to come together by what's called an electrostatic interaction, right? opposites attract type of thing. Um, and we refer to these two types of, of ions as cations, which are going to be the positive charge, and anions, which are going to be the negative charge. So whenever you have an ionic compound, you're always going to have a cation reacting with an anion, or I should say not really reacting, but kind of attracted to each other. All right, so here are your cations. A cation has fewer electrons than protons, or you could say more protons than electrons. But again, remember that you're always uh, going to be, uh, in this case, losing an electron. Uh, so if we look at the, the makeup here of a sodium atom, so what we can see in the sodium atom, if we wrote out the electron configuration like we looked at last chapter down here, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, there's one electron in the outer shell. Or another way of saying that is there's one valence electron. Okay, so you're going to have one valence electron. Um, that valence electron is going to be lost. So the idea in forming an ion is you're always trying to get to a full valence shell. So if you only have one valence electron there, and remember our valence shells usually have eight electrons, so sodium could in theory gain seven electrons. That's a whole lot of electrons to put in there. Alternatively, it could just lose one. So it's much easier for it to lose one. So the nucleus 
of a sodium atom has 11 protons and 12 neutrons. In the sodium ion, nothing changes in the nucleus, right? You still have the 11 protons and the 12 neutrons. What changes is what happens out here in the electron cloud. You go from 11 electrons over to 10 electrons. So we can say we lose one electron. If you lose a negative charge, by definition, it's going to become more positive, right? So if you look over here, we had an equal number of protons and electrons, 11 and 11. Now you have 11 and 10. So now, overall, this sodium ion is going to be a cation, meaning it's positively charged, and it's going to have a plus 1 charge, which you can see there. And again, the important thing here to kind of understand conceptually is that anytime you form an ion, you're always going to end up with a full valence shell. So in this case, the second shell would be full. Anions are just the opposite. Um, anions are going to gain an electron, which is going to make them negatively charged. It means that they're going to have more electrons than protons. So again, now we're going to look at chlorine. So chlorine has 17 protons and 18 neutrons in its nucleus. Again, even after it forms an ion, it's still going to have those 17 protons and 18 neutrons in the nucleus. But what happens is, is for chlorine, it has 7 valence electrons. Right? So, it could lose all 7 of those valence electrons, or it could simply gain one more. It's much easier for it to gain one more. One more. So you can see here it mentions gaining one electron is going from 17 electrons to 18. In the chloride anion, right, the anion means it has a negative charge, has a full outer shell. This time, right now it has eight. And because it gained that electron, it's going to gain an extra negative charge. And that's going to be our chloride anion. So chloride, it's going to have a negative one charge. Sodium, which we looked at on the previous slide, would have a plus one charge. So the rule that we need to know for these ions is referred to as the octet rule, and you're going to hear about this octet rule quite a few times. Um, the idea is that the idea of an octet is that's when you have a full valence shell, right? And the exception to that would be um, hydrogen or helium, right? Because they're in that first shell, they can only fill two electrons. But everything else on the periodic table, right, can really form up to eight. I guess lithium is also... Um, an exception to the octet rule. Lithium uh, has three, well, one valence electron and three total electrons, so it would lose one electron to fill um, its outer shell. But we'll look at that one here in a minute, in a few minutes. Um, so by losing electrons, one, two, or three electrons, an atom forms a cation. By gaining one, two, or three electrons, an atom forms an anion. And the goal here is to get a completely filled outer shell. All right, so what we need to be able to do is look at the periodic table and find an element on there and determine what charge it's going to be able to form. So a couple things to keep in mind here. Um, metals are going to form cations. Nonmetals are going to form anions, right? Cations being positively charged, anions being negatively charged. Uh, for the metals, in groups 1a, 2a, or 3a, the group number is equal to the charge. And then for the nonmetals, the anion is going to be 8 minus the group number. So that's kind of one way to think about it. Um, let's look at the periodic table here, and you can kind of see. So if it's in group 1a, anything down here, right, it's going to form a plus 1 charge. Because what I like to kind of... Imagine, right, the goal of an ion is to look like a noble gas after it gains or loses electrons, right? Remember, the noble gases are over here in 8A. So you can almost imagine, right, that lithium, even though it's here, is very similar to this one right there. So you can almost imagine group 8A being over here as well, right? Because if lithium loses one electron it's going to end up just like whatever is over here in 8A. It would just be the one above it. Um, sodium, if it loses an electron, it's going to look like a noble gas. So picture your noble gases on either side of the periodic table. So the goal is these things have to move this way, right? It's going to move this way. 
potassium is going to move that way. By moving to the left, it means you're losing an electron. If you lose an electron, you're going to have a positive charge. So lithium, in order to get to be a noble gas, it has to move one time. Beryllium, to get like a noble gas, has to move one, two times. So it's going to have a plus two charge. So anything in group one is going to have a plus one charge. Anything in group two is going to have a plus two charge. And then aluminum over here in group three is going to have a plus three charge. Now, if we go over to the nonmetals, right, again, they want to get like a noble gas. So if you look at our halogens, remember the halogens are the one in group 7A. Halogens would have to move one time to be like a noble gas. One time. They, but moving to the right means they have to gain an electron. So again, all of these have to gain one electron. If they gain one electron, they're going to have a negative one charge. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, they would have to move two times. So they would have a minus two charge. Nitrogen is right here. It could have a minus three charge because it would have to move three times. So again, see how many times it has to move in order to get like a noble gas. If it's moving to the right, it has to gain an electron. If it moves to the left, it has to lose an electron. And then you can figure out your charge um, from that. Now, there are a lot of metals in the middle part of the periodic table where we call the transition metals, right? Um, that have a variable charge. I do not need you to go through and memorize all of these. Um, what you'll notice is that some of them, like chromium, or iron, or copper, or gold, or lead, or tin, right? Many of these have a variable charge, meaning they can either be plus two or plus three, or in the case of copper, plus one or plus two. Now, some of them do not have a variable charge. Like cobalt here is always going to be plus two. Nickel is always going to be plus two. I don't want you to worry about all that. What I want you to know is that here in the middle we have transition metals. Right? And I want you to think, anytime you see a transition metals, you should think, okay, it can have a variable charge. All right? Even if it's one that can't. As far as I'm concerned, I want you to treat everything um, that is a transition metal like it can have a variable charge. And we'll talk about what that's going to mean um, in the next video and whenever we talk a little bit about naming ions and kind of how we have to treat these ones, um, how we have to treat these transition metals slightly different than we do the others whenever we talk about them.